Welcome to the Legion Strength and Conditioning Podcast. You can check us out at legionsc.com or follow us on Instagram at legion.sc. So within CrossFit as a sport, a common phrase used is engine, uh, which generally refers to someone who does well in a wide variety of conditioning workouts. But if we kind of start to break stuff down, we can see that there's a lot of different types of conditioning workouts with a lot of different characteristics. And while there are some athletes who tend to do well on pretty much any and all conditioning, uh, and those are typically the folks who are at the top of the sport, if we start to break things down for people who aren't necessarily as talented or as elite, uh, let's call it then then those folks can have some pretty shocking differences in terms of their abilities in certain types of workouts compared to other types of workouts. Um, and if we think about this in terms of just general capacity, um, you know, not necessarily within the context of doing like mixed modal sport uh, versus capacity within mixed modal sport, meaning more like going back and forth between thrusters and double unders or uh, doing a 21-15-9 of something or like heavy repeated power cleans or something like that. We can start to see some differences as well between just someone who overall has capacity for a lot of different activities, meaning they can maybe do some CrossFit and go for a jog and do, you know, recreational sport and all that kind of stuff, but they may not be great at the specific CrossFit style activities uh, versus someone who is actually just really good at doing um, kind of like mixed body weight and barbell movements. And so um, if we think about engine, right, as sort of this general term, uh, it, it can be difficult to train your quote unquote engine if you aren't really clear on what we're actually talking about and what you need to get better at as an athlete. So again, there's some folks who are just kind of great across the board. And if they just do a lot of stuff, they get better at it. Uh, but for other people it can be a little bit tricky because they may be great at, let's call it, you know, rowing intervals and assault bike intervals and all that kind of stuff, but they're really not good at doing double unders and box jumps. And it's not always just a movement issue. Sometimes it's related to the specific characteristics of certain types of workouts or, um, or training sessions. Um, you know, b beyond just the idea of like, okay, this involves breathing heavy. It may involve more muscle endurance component. It may involve more um, moving blood around the entire body. It may involve being able to do repeated movements that require the same muscle group, like your, uh, your rotator cuff or something like that. Um, and then understanding that these are not all exactly the same thing and that they may need to be trained differently can give a lot of insight in terms of uh, what we actually mean when we talk about someone with a quote unquote good engine. Um, so Luke, we were talking just about the uh, the different types of workouts that people might experience uh, that they may think of as just like, oh, I'm doing a Metcon, but that there's a lot of uh, potential subtlety and distinction between these workouts. So um, can you give us a rundown of just like what some of these different terms are that are that are kind of thrown around under the, the larger umbrella of conditioning? yeah so i think that with uh with sort of all these these workouts all grouped together a lot of people do see see them as just doing crossfit uh, and just working out doing a metcon doing their conditioning you know however they would term it um but there's a lot of different actual skills and energy systems and um different capacities that are being trained through different metcons <clears throat> so uh one example would be something that's going to be more of a grinder based which would be uh, involving something that's going to be fairly low turnover uh quite heavy tough movements um maybe some complex gymnastics some strict gymnastics um and then usually going on for a longer period of time you might have something that's going to be more typical uh, CrossFit, which is what we tend to sort of see in the open, which is couplets and triplets, uh, working in sort of that 10 minute range, um, going back and forth, high turnover type work. Um, in this open, we had some e easy examples with that with like 19.1, 19.4 19.5. Um, you could say that the sort of more chipper element of uh, 19.3 could be associated with something that's more grinder based um, and then you have as well as that uh, workouts that are going to be more aerobic based where it involves uh, a high volume of monostructural work within that as well so you're going to be looking at workouts with uh, longer distance on bike on the row skier whatever it is some running in there as well um, and then you also have sort of heavier workouts, more strength-based workouts, which are going to be um, using the barbell, which is definitely going to be sort of testing your battery uh, within that as well. So there's different ways that we can... What do you mean by battery? So battery being sort of your ability to... 
uh, recover from repeated efforts at like something that's fairly uh, high effort, uh, yet still submaximal. So typical example, um, which I think a lot of people know the test is hitting a max power clean um, and then going into an eight minute AMRAP uh, at 90%. That's, uh, that's a, a test used to sort of determine your, your battery with weightlifting and then also uh, pulling endurance. But what we're looking at there is um, essentially just, for, say for instance, the likes of Matt Fraser and Rich Froning are perfect examples of people with great battery because they can operate at those higher weights close to their max and they can sort of continue with that as well. And females generally have um, a, uh, they have a higher ability in this as well. And, and you can sort of see that from say 16.2 uh, and 19.2 and the scores and the disparity in scores between male and female scores as well. Um, but yeah, I think that, that, that I think is important, uh, as you mentioned, Todd, that if you are going to look to train your engine or your capacity, you have to understand what it is and where it lacks or what it is you're trying to achieve with that. And what we also have to understand as well is uh, skill level is a huge skill level and strength is a huge uh, determiner in, in, in someone's capacity as well. So the elite have such a high skill level and they have such an exposure to those skills that they can demonstrate a quote unquote engine when it comes to complex gymnastics and things like that. So someone might be going through 19.5 and that is almost a battery based workout for the chest bar pull ups because they're looking at repeatability and trying to recover uh, through that sort of high threshold movement for them. But say, for instance, for those people in, on the elite level, they're just moving through that as quickly as possible. And then literally just as soon as they feel like they're going to burn out, dropping off a little bit and then getting back into it. So you have to understand that skill level and strength level and um, overall fitness is a huge determiner in, in understanding sort of where someone's engine is at. So most people... Um, your sort of average, you know, average Joe CrossFitter is going to be looking at uh, an engine based workout, probably to be something where they can demonstrate capacity through, say, rowing and air squats and burpees and lighter based movements like that. Yeah. And I think that one of the other things that um, can get, you know, just a, a, another layer of complexity going here has to do with the, um, the just the, the muscle endurance demands um, throughout these like quote unquote engine based workouts, right? If we um, circle back to the the open, since that's something that happened recently and people have a frame of reference for it, right? If we have uh, you know a, a fifteen minute AMRAP of rowing calories and wall balls, um, it's one type of workout. If it's nineteen and nineteen, um, you know it's a different type of workout. If it's uh, let's call it thirty and thirty, it's a different type of workout. If it's seven and seven, it's a different type of workout. If it's fifty and fifty. And that, again, if we look at the top levels of the sport, the people who are at the top are probably going to win kind of no matter how that's structured, whether it was seven row calories, seven wall balls, 15 row calories, 15 wall balls, you know, 31 row calories, 31 wall balls that they'll, they'll still win. Um, but if you look at people who are not at that totally elite level, uh, I would hypothesize that you would see pretty significant and surprising disparities in how people do depending on what those rep schemes look like. Right, because some people are much better at moving back and forth between different movements somewhat quickly that they're able to kind of like recover and maintain a relatively high power output. But if the sets get too big, then they have to dig too far into muscle endurance and then they kind of hit like a some sort of tipping point where they're just unable to continue, right? That they've accumulated too much fatigue and they start to get sort of like a um like a shutdown, either of like a an occlusion and sort of like a specific muscle group, which then potentially triggers like a, a global fatigue response. Um, um, or something. I mean, who knows what's actually happening. Um, but other people are actually maybe not as good at uh, maintaining just like very high power output in terms of going, you know, relatively fast for them on um, rowing and then being able to like quickly transition and move into wall balls that just like that they, they have a harder time maintaining that like high effort throughout. But if they have to do, let's call it 50 wall balls in a row repeatedly, which is going to be something that a lot of people are going to be fractioning over the course of 15 minutes, um, that they're much better than other people at doing 
a set of 20, quickly picking the ball up, doing a set of 15, you know, quickly picking the ball up. And they just like never actually hit that muscle endurance fatigue point that sort of shuts them down. Um, so you can see, you can start to see that disparity in terms of people being able to either maintain relatively high power output and transition quickly, especially if the movements don't have significant interference between each other, meaning that like you're not just fatiguing the same muscle group repeatedly um, versus people who are much better at like chipping away at stuff and doing small sets and quickly going again. Um, so, you know, if, if you start to really think about that, it's like, okay, well, what's actually going on there? And you start to think through what are the implications for engine building for someone who struggles with muscle endurance and bigger sets versus the implication of uh, um, engine building in someone who is potentially good at muscle endurance and bigger sets, but struggles with maintaining like a, a, an overall max power output for a certain period of time. Um, and, Again, we're, we're dealing with a little bit of a, a black box here in terms of what we're actually able to, to dial in and focus in on in training. But I do think that um, we, we, we should have some clarity surrounding why we're doing certain things and what type of athlete we're potentially working with based upon that. Yeah, like, go, go on, John. I think, Luke, you brought up a good point um, when talking about kind of ability level um, with that regard. So, I think 19.5 is a good example of this, that it's for, I'd say 80% of the population is what I class as a grinder. Like the, the intensity is not that high. The speed isn't that high. Um, they're just kind of chipping away at those reps. For the elite, it really is a, a higher intensity piece and perhaps more quote unquote engine based as a workout. Um, and I think the ability of the athlete plays a lot into the perception of that workout. Um, so I think you have to be careful in terms of grouping workouts because it really does depend on the athlete's ability as to what they'd class. For me, a grinder would be, um, anything that's kind of, you know, over 15 minutes where the movement speed itself isn't that fast. Um, so maybe it's a, it's movements with a slower cycle time in the reps. Um, or maybe the, the length of the workout dictates that the cycle time is slower. Um, whereas a constant movement piece, whereas, you know, 19.1, I consider that kind of a engine workout as it were, because it's relatively high turnover, regardless of what score you're getting. Yeah. Like I think, um, one of the things that we we're all sort of touching upon here is that as much as we want to be able to simplify things down to this, I'm going to just turn that as a you know an engine based workout or that that athlete has a, a great engine or whatever it is uh these things are a lot more complex than we we sort of would like them to be um essentially i think a lot of people try to create simplicity but then it also turns into a bit of like reductionist thinking when in actual fact it's there there are a lot of details um in someone's performance there's lots of different variables in workouts and the sport itself and it's really important that there's a good gauge on individual ability in certain areas uh, so whether that's you know you're obviously going to be your more monostructural based work okay what are your max gymnastic numbers what are your absolute strength numbers it's, it's important to understand that type of work but then also understanding uh, what's happening through mixed modal pieces as well because I think a lot of people have this sort of assumption that like if someone's 5k is here and someone's power clean is here they're going to do great in this workout where you know as you said Todd it's like if they start to get like an occlusion in a certain muscle group and then all of a sudden they just start basically like putting their hands on their knees and sucking wind then you know well their 5k is here and their max power clean is here why are they not so I think that what we need to do is we need to make sure that, uh, well, people just need to make sure that they are understanding sort of where their ability is at, but also that that's not indicative of the sport itself as well, um, because there's just, a, and it's always changing as well, and, they, and there's always new tests coming out, um, and I think that it's really important, and the people who are going to succeed in this are either those people who basically can just do more work and just hammer themselves all the time and get it in and they they have their life set up to do that they have the sort of genetic ceiling to do that as well uh, or is it going to be those people who are going to be looking into this a little bit more in depth and being objective through everything and using data effectively um, but then also understanding that the sport is chaotic and being flexible within that as well 
Um, but I think overall with, in terms of training and developing your quote unquote engine, um, going through aerobic work and then developing your aerobic system is going to have a great effect for most people. And I think that it's, it's something, it's, a, it's the same as, you know, getting someone to, uh, you know, go into the gym, and start training on the barbell for the first time, they're going to get stronger. If you give someone aerobic work, structured aerobic work, and they've never done that before, they're going to get fitter. And that is going to have some carryover to uh, their performance in CrossFit, but at the same time, when they're trying to sort of move from that, say, bubble athlete into something that's going to be a little bit more elite, then that's where things have to be really specific. And people can't be just doing, you know, they, they just can't be repackaging the same 30 on 30 off intervals um, forever, just to sort of develop their engine so that they can carry on the sport and get fitter. Yeah, I think that the, um, the, one of the one of the points that you're kind of touching on there is sort of what we were talking about in the intro, meaning that there's a difference between let's just call it like overall capacity and sport specific capacity, right? That um, the the assumption would be that if your five k time or your two k time gets better, um, that that will then improve your um, fifteen minute AMRAP of rowing and wall balls, and that that's not necessarily the case, right? That someone who has like a a poor 5k time, right. For a male athlete, let's call it over 20 minutes. Um, you know, that that's potentially indicative of a problem, um, in terms of overall capacity, but that that doesn't necessarily mean that simply by improving that 5k time, that that individual will get better at rowing and wall balls, right? They need to do rowing and wall balls to get better at rowing and wall balls. And Luke, to your point that developing the aerobic system as a whole is, is a, a positive training adaptation since that makes overall training, um, go better. And it makes you, um, you know, recover better between sessions, recover better between sets, recover better between AM and PM sessions, et cetera. But that that's, that's not necessarily what's going to make you better at again, just doing rowing and wall balls. Um, so, you know, when, when we think about these, these concepts of like building an engine, a lot of people are trying to just improve their rowing times and their biking times and get volume of rowing, biking, skiing, running. Um, and then, you know, 20 minute workouts of double unders and burpees and all that kind of stuff. But that the, the actual thing that they may need to work on may be their ability to go deep in muscle endurance sets under aerobic fatigue, right? So the best training protocol is not necessarily 500 meter row repeats or 20 minute AMRAP of 400 meter run, uh, 21 burpees, 15 box jumps or whatever that they may end up having a hard time with, um, let's call it, high repetition muscle endurance based squatting in an aerobic setting. And so what may work well for them is actually, um, five sets of 500 meter row at 85% effort, uh, 21 wall balls, 15 goblet squats, and then, um, 30 air squats or something, right? So meaning that they're able to keep doing this squatting based motion under a little bit of fatigue from rowing so that they're out of breath, which will impact their ability to kind of like move around muscle, uh, you know, metabolic waste from, from the muscles and then keep doing a squatting pattern in that fatigue based state. Um, and then be able to sustain that and repeat it. Right. And that that's, that's, potentially too granular in terms of like trying to dial in this exact weakness for this individual. Cause like you mentioned, Luke, we still need to have like certain levels of chaos and just a bunch of different stuff happening. But that, you know, if we, if we really think about what's going on, we, we may need to be that focus in terms of like, all right, we need to do squatting muscle endurance based activities since your quads lock up and then you fall apart when you do squatting based muscle endurance activities in a CrossFit conditioning workout. It doesn't mean you need to do, you know, leg extensions and split squats to work on your quad muscle endurance. It means you need to be able to, um, pump blood through the quad while squatting to clear metabolic waste and, you know, recycle lactate. Um, Again, who knows what's actually happening on like a truly physiological level, but um, you know that 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 I think that's the type of concept that um, we we really need to think about if we're thinking about engine training. It's not just rowing intervals. Yeah, like I think that people are very welcoming of trying out, you know, new and different, diverse training techniques when it comes to developing skill, developing people's strength, um, and this seems sort of quite popular, but then it's almost when people were trying to develop their capacity, it's like they just do more CrossFit or they just do more very, very simple stuff. And whilst I do think that there is like this, 
need for simplicity through training uh, and that things can get like, you know, as you said, Todd, you can be quite granular with this, this type of stuff. But the sport at the end of the day, if you're looking to compete at a level, you know, above the open is going to be, you know, typical CrossFit, couplets and triplets. And you have to look at those movements. You have to look at the link and the pattern. Like you go through the open, you figure out the movements that you struggled with. You understand, is there a link between all of them? Oh, that might be something that I need to work on as, a, as an overall thing, as opposed to it just being like, well, I suck at this movement, so I need to do more of that. And I suck at that because I need to do more of that. And overall, I felt out of breath through all the workouts. So I just need to do a shit ton of intervals now. And all of a sudden, all those things are going to go up. And it's like, there could be an overlying problem um, that you're not addressing. And all you're doing is you're basically just, uh, you, you're potentially improving your ability to compensate and suffer through things, but not actually making a substantial change in how you're performing as an athlete through skill or physiology and all of that, all of that stuff. Yeah. And that feeling out of breath doesn't necessarily mean that, um, you know, your aerobic capacity quote unquote is your limiter, right? That hitting that fatigue response, um, again is, is, complex and, and messy in terms of what's actually going on and what triggers it. And a lot of it is actually mediated, um, you know, by the brain and the central nervous system in terms of saying, okay, you know, we're doing too much work. We're accumulating too much metabolic waste. Our perception of effort is too high relative to how much time we have left, uh, to work and that you will get a variety of different fatigue responses from different scenarios. And just because you feel out of breath doesn't mean that it's because you can't transport oxygen in and out of your lungs fast enough, right? That, um, you can end up feeling, too out of breath because you did one too many strict handstand pushups, which then um, created you know this this inability to pump blood um, through the body uh, based upon like an occlusion in your shoulders, which then uh, you know spiked your blood pressure and uh, tripped some sort of central nervous system based fatigue mechanism, uh, which says something's going wrong. Our blood pressure is too high. Uh, we're not able to get blood in and out of this area and the metabolic waste is accumulating, which means that we need to try to do something to clear it. So like, let's elevate respiration rate. And now all of a sudden we're breathing super heavy based upon doing one too many strict handstand pushups. And it's not like the, the, the actual oxygen exchange rate is the problem that the problem is that you tripped this global fatigue mechanism because you're unable to, um, you know, clear metabolic waste and pump blood effectively uh, in a fatigue-based setting of shoulder muscle endurance, and that that's like a totally different scenario. I I don't know if this is entirely relevant, but I did get out of breath yesterday when talking <laughs> whilst demonstrating a movement with a PVC. <laughs> that that PVC just like set off a global global fatigue <laughs> mechanism um and yeah you uh, what's your whoop score today <laughs> uh, well actually i'm whoop free so i have no idea i'm i'd imagine i'm probably at about 30 percent recovery after that do you have a do you have an aura ring <laughs> do you know what yes. the aura, it's, it's, it's one of those new so it's now become a bracelet it's now it's now a ring that people wear to track sleep and and recovery and oh research. i thought you meant like i'm feeling very purple today <laughs> <laughs> you fucking weird okay. man because <laughs> i'm not I'm, I'm, i'd probably say orange if i had to nail it down <laughs> um, <laughs> what um like uh now because I, I know i know this is a sort of a hot topic of a discussion and you know people talk about mindset and all this type of stuff what do you think of people who now like I used to work in an affiliate the, the, and we used to have to program things called mental toughness, toughness workouts. Um, and I, I like, I really disliked the term cause it was just like, this, this is not, and it was pretty much just anything that was sort of like, you know, long and slow and, um, boring or quote unquote boring. Um, as, uh, as people say, um, but yeah, like what, what do you think, is the sort of more uh, mental aspect of training through stuff like this. Because it's, I think that if people are going to be pushing their capacity, uh, and, and I know, Todd, you've mentioned something about l people who are low, low perception. 
Um, but like, yeah, like what, what, what do you think is going to be essential for someone um, who's going to embark on a period of training that is going to be improving their engine or how can they improve their engine through uh, baby, basically a mental approach to, to their training? I mean, my thought on that is that there has to be some kind of mental preparation, I guess, on the understanding that some of that training isn't going to be that enjoyable or glamorous or fun. Um, and you have to go into it with a mindset of it may not be the most fun, but it's going to be useful for me over time. Um, and it's going to, you know, this, the suckiness of it is going to have a payoff in the end. Um, I'm kind of with you on the, the mental toughness stuff. I, uh, I do occasionally program things which are mentally difficult to keep moving and keep wanting to do well at, but it's more of a a trepidation factor for athletes that, wow, this looks hard, this is not going to be fun, and they still get through it and they do well. Um, yeah, I think there's a I think there's a bit of a difference between um, like mental toughness quote unquote, in terms of like mental toughness training, just meaning doing stuff that's just fucking terrible and you know, it's going to be terrible and it's going to, um, hurt a lot and take a certain amount of just like whatever, uh, pushing and willpower to get through, um, versus I think the concepts of discipline, which are more important for engine building, I think, right. That discipline means the ability to do, you know, an hour of different kinds of repeats at a sustainable pace, right? The discipline comes from understanding, okay, this is the actual pace that I can go on the assault bike to do this rather than, oh, I'm just going to see what happens if I try to hold 78 RPM and then just dying and suffering through the rest of it, right? Even though the suffering may be more painful, um, which may be like a tougher workout and in some people's eyes may build more mental toughness, quote unquote, that the discipline to actually develop your engine is going to come from understanding appropriate pacing, being willing to sort of like put in just the the somewhat monotonous work of accumulating repetitions at a sustainable pace. And then um, over the course of building into a more like competitive period, understanding that ramp up process of saying, okay, I was able to hold this pace for this scenario where I'm doing these types of repeats for an hour. And now I'm doing this type of scenario where it's not intended to be as sustainable. So I need to escalate my pace a little bit, but that doesn't mean I'm still just, you know, flying out the gate guns blazing and, and, you know, suffering through the the back half of my training session. Um, it also is going to be, um, like we talked about earlier, that this understanding of developing your aerobic capacity as a whole is going to improve your recovery between training sessions, which means that you're not necessarily just doing stuff to get you better at CrossFit. You're getting stuff that you're doing stuff that is going to get you better at the ability to do a lot of CrossFit over the course of a week. And that that's kind of like a, a step back in terms of thinking through like layers of abstraction where you're like, okay, I need to think about not just this specific training session, but what I'm doing Doing to improve my set of training sessions over a week and that that discipline is hard for people too because there's not an obvious or immediate payoff to it yeah i think one of the things as well as was sort of on that note as i uh you, I, I noticed that people do uh workouts and they sort of characterize them as more engine based or more mental capacity or mental toughness basically just because of how they look on paper and some of the most simple stuff and some of the most the, is, 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 is the hardest and would be what I would essentially rec- uh, say that requires uh, more mental toughness is, you know, are you able to dig deep on this workout because you know it's going to just be you going close to 100% or, you know, as close as you can maintain for a very long time. Um but yeah, I think that that discipline uh, point is key because I think that is much harder. Um, is just sort of, I always, I, I sometimes term it as basically mental, when I would give like my uh, my sort of uh, workout briefs, drinking the Kool-Aid at the affiliate, it would be like, okay, cool. Like mental toughness is, and I would be basically saying that where your tactics and your ability sort of meet and intersect and you're able to maintain that. And that is what it is. And I think that's sort of similar to what you were saying with the sort of discipline piece. Um, and I think that's what people are sort of missing is they, I think people get into this and they just, 
uh, wildly overestimate sort of their abilities and then they you know do ridiculously hard workouts on paper and they just can't maintain it yeah i mean most people training with any form of um you know, like competitive ambition, or even just like people who take their training seriously at an affiliate who want to get better and like do more work. Like these people don't need to be told to do hard stuff, right? Like that's just, that's just not the missing piece for most people. Most people who are training in CrossFit are not missing the desire to do hard stuff. They're not missing the ability to push through when things get challenging. Um, you know, what they are potentially missing is the discipline and understanding of building sustainable capacity and pacing appropriately. And they're potentially missing the, uh, um, I don't know the, the, the ability to catch front runner mentality, which is, I think I'm going to be able to do this. I'm off of where I think I should be. So I'm going to quit on this workout, right? Those are the problems that people have. It's not that they can't do hard shit and leading into a competition. Yeah. They need to do a bunch of hard shit to be able to do hard shit. Cause if you're not doing it, you're, you're just, you're just going to get smoked when that comes up. Um, but that, you know, that I think that that's more of like a, a time and a place for like a pre comp period. And that just like, quote unquote, building, uh, mental toughness for the sake of like teaching people to push harder. I just think that that's not the missing piece for almost everyone who's training hard. I think that, uh, in terms of engine building, right. It, it, for, for people just kind of trying to work out, it doesn't need to be maybe as detailed or as granular as we got into with some of these discussions, but just understanding that there's different uh, facets of having an engine and understanding you know where you sit in terms of like, what is your overall capacity? Are you missing more muscle endurance related pieces? Um, are there certain types of workouts or combinations of movements that give you trouble? Are you able to pace yourself appropriately? That these are the types of things that actually impact how you should be thinking about building an engine, not just sort of like haphazardly doing rowing intervals or uh, um, like quote unquote Metcons. And uh, you know, that that sometimes a coach can be helpful with that, but it's not necessarily like the the absolute most important thing. But um, I mean, you, you, re you really just need to know what type of athlete am I and what am I missing? And then try to focus on that. And it's, and it's potentially a little more complicated than the uh, your first impulse. Thanks for listening. While you're here, go ahead and head over to your podcast player, subscribe to the show, give it a rating, give it a review, all that good stuff. You can also go ahead and click through the show notes where you can find out more about us at legionsc.com and also follow us on Instagram at legion.sc.